I'm Matt Schmucker, director of Nine Marks. We believe the local church is the focal point of God's plan for displaying His glory to the nations. Our vision is simple, churches that reflect the character of God. To that end, we pray that Nine Marks Audio will benefit both you and your local church. Listen, learn, and join the conversation. Uh, we are with David Wells, the Andrew Much Professor of Theology at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in South Hamilton, Massachusetts. David, thank you for being willing to be interviewed again. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Now, the last time we talked about two and a half years ago, it was just before your most recent book, Above All Earthly Powers, came out. Are you pleased with uh, how the book turned out? I don't know if you'd quite finished it when we last talked. I had almost finished it, I think. Um, well, to be honest, uh, it, it was a struggle, and um, I think uh, I think the struggle that I went through uh, in writing it uh, perhaps reflects the struggle that many people experience today in the church, and don't always aren't always able to identify what it is that they're struggling with. I think we all struggle with knowing how to be Christian in our own given context. Uh, you can learn doctrine, and you can watch television and go to movies, but forging a Christian worldview uh, in which those two things intersect, uh, your Christian confession and the world in which you're living, is much more difficult than than, than most of us realize. Uh, I went through um, a really very difficult time uh, trying to think about this, and I was surprised because I, I've been reflecting on the modern and postmodern world for quite a long time. Yeah, this, this is what your whole project is sort of about. Yes, yes it is. Of course, this particular book, uh, I was thinking about uh, the person work of Christ, and I was remedying what was a deficiency in a previous book because a number of years ago I wrote a book on the person of Christ. It was a biblical and historical study. That was the recipe that was given to me. And I can say I was assigned it maybe by you in seminary. It was a great book. Very clear, excellent biblical theological reflection, historical work on the early councils. Yes, that, that's what I was asked to do. But so why would you feel that was lacking? Because the final component, I, I think, of, of any reflection, biblical and historical reflection on the person of Christ, needs to be the places at which this engages our fallen world and culture. But, now, but now when you're saying that, do you, do you mean that a systematic theology volume, most systematic theology volumes that are laying around out there are not well done because they lack that component? I think that that's correct, okay. uh, and I've said that even of my great hero, Charles Hodge, uh -huh. that uh, I think it is... You had that great article on, in CT on back in a long many, time ago. Many years yeah. ago. Let us not say how many years <laughs> ago. Um, but I, 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 have, I have reflected on this, that, that it is remarkable. If you take Hodge's systematic, and if you take out some of the names of contemporaries that he is... Uh, you wouldn't know when it was written. You wouldn't yeah. have the faintest idea of where now, they but, came but from. But David, what is it about me that likes that? I mean, I think, it, I think, isn't that helpful in some way? It is. It's keying on something that's terribly important, which is uh, that Christianity is timeless. Uh, it is the same truth. It is the same gospel that's believed in all places and times by all people. And that's why we can have communion with Augustine and Calvin and others who have believed that gospel and believe that truth. Uh, this is not a time-specific truth. Otherwise, there'd be different gospels and different Christianities. So that's the great thing that I think people like Hodge have seen. On the other hand, I believe that uh, in our time, uh, understanding our culture uh, takes on an urgency because... This culture is so intrusive uh, and, and it is uh, 
It is so powerful in its capacity to shape our souls and our minds that if we're not, as it were, uh, pushing back from an explicitly biblical Christian point of view, we're going to get swallowed up. And so in that sense, you're seeing this culture as being more, not only maybe more malevolent to the gospel, but more able to be so effectively. I, th I think that is correct because it is, it is more uh, intense um, and uh, because we never escape from it. Okay now, okay, now when you say more intense, do you mean the difference between watching a movie and reading a book? I do. I mean, that's a good illustration. Uh, when you read a book, you, you, you may get very involved in the plot yeah. and the characters, but at any moment you can close it. So there is always that distance between you and the book, and you can stop and think and uh, maybe have a conversation about what you've just read. But when you're in a movie, the movie never stops, and you are enveloped in, a, in it, and your emotions are engaged in a way that they're not quite engaged by a book. They're engaged in a different sort of way. Okay, we're going to pick this back up, but um, one guy in our church who's a deacon, Ken Barbick, has started reading your books. He's read through all four of them now. He's such a David Wells junkie. He's gone down to the Library of Congress, checked out your Turning to God, Volume 1 Conversion. He was sitting in my study the other night reading that. So what are you doing reading that? He said, I've become a David Wells junkie. Well, uh, let me tell you that this last week uh, on the Internet, uh, somebody, a blogger, wrote uh, that he was not going to read any book by David Wells, a foul-mouthed ex-Yankee pitcher. <laughs> and he could have, of course, said ex-Red Sox, too, but I think it's more despicable to be a Yankee. So you see, foul-mouthed and ex-Yankee. Okay, so then back to Above All Earthly Powers, after yes. our little relief there. Um, have you been pleased with how the book has been received? I'm not really aware of how it has been received. Use the analogy in this last interview we did, uh, and if, you got, if, if those of you listening to this, if you want to know more about David's own personal history and the history of his thought, get, uh, go listen to the first interview I did with him. Um, this one, uh, we're focusing more on this latest book. And David, in that earlier interview, you said it was like shooting an arrow over a, over a mountain. You don't really know where they land. But, but you've, you've certainly heard, you've heard back from some people. I have heard back from some people, and most of what I've heard back uh, is that it's too difficult and too demanding. Really? Yes, which, which I have to say surprises me. Uh, but I do think um, that it, it is a reflection uh, both of our declining theological doctrinal literacy yeah. and it is a reflection of the sort of uh, pace of our lives and the tensions under which we live um, that it's very difficult for us to, to work up the psychological energy that is needed to engage some sustained yeah. reasoning. Uh, we, we're much more inclined to look for very short paragraphs, yeah. bullets, well, short headings. Just in, in defense of you or your editors, um, the, book is, the, the chapters are fairly long. Mm -hmm. They're cut up into subheadings, though, very clearly. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to this and you're one of those people who really can't read a 30-page chapter, and I don't know if there are even any 30-page chapters in the book as it's edited and written, but... Um, there are lots of subheadings. You'll be able to get through. It's worth, you, you, should, you should make the effort to get through it. And I think, I think you'll find there's so much stuff in it that's so interesting. And, David, I think you, you've done such a good job of uh, not only thinking about what it is you want to say, but finding very apt illustrations from the culture that I think, if you're listening to this and you're a preacher, I think you'll find a lot of material in there to help you understand better the world that you're walking around in and uh, how doctrine is applied and how it interacts with that. Which, David, I think it's what you're out to do in the book. Mm, uh, that's what I tried to do. But uh, well, unlike your other books, I think, maybe with No Place Where Truth Has Happened, with this one, it, this inspired a whole conference. It did. How was the John Piper living fest shrift to David Wells work? <laughs> well, I was uh, very honored.
to uh, be part of that conference. It was, I think, one of the most interesting conferences I've been at. And I was um, so encouraged uh, by the people who were there, many of whom were quite young, at least from where I stood, in their 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, who were obviously there because they wanted to engage with uh, serious themes. And um, uh, the other speakers were uh, substantive speakers. So I thought this was a wonderful uh, harbinger for the future. So if someone says, uh, yeah, Dr. Wells, I don't really read books, but I do listen to things on the Internet, if they get those um, talks from Desiring God and listen to them, will they have picked up much of what was in your Above All Earthly Powers? They won't, I don't think the answer would be no. They won't have picked up a lot. Yeah. Um, I did the opening talk, which was introductory to the whole theme. And, and you did an exposition on what, Colossians Hebrews. 2 or Hebrews 1? Hebrews, yes, on the supremacy of Christ. Right. Um, and uh, the other speakers picked up on the theme of the supremacy of Christ, but they did it from their own angles. So everybody at the conference had a copy of my book. but Had not, anybody read it? Some had read it. it were the panel discussions, because I know there were, what, two panel discussions? Yes. Did those have anything to do directly with your book? No. Okay. So it was more, your book was more used as a, um, a, a, a label to bring up the whole topic of gospel and culture. That's correct. Okay. And how was that? Was that okay? It, it, was, it was very interesting because um, we had uh, a representative of the emerging church, Mark Driscoll, uh, and we had uh, Tim Keller, who is in the heart of New York City. And between those two, or, or, or those two occupied uh, two points on the continuum that were really uh, a little different. How were, how were they different? I think they were different because um, Tim Keller's uh, more uh, a multi, multi-ethnic uh, context in New York City, very cosmopolitan, and I think Mark Driscoll uh, is, of course, much younger. He's, I think, 34 years old um, and uh, focused in upon a much younger, specifically postmodern kind of generation. But in their way of understanding gospel and culture, they'd be very similar. I think they would be very similar, uh, although uh, Tim Keller is, is, of course, a very uh, creative uh, thinker. And um, Mark is, is young, but Mark's outreach has been quite extraordinary too. So they were very different uh, but uh, I thought they brought some wonderful insights. And did you feel that in the panel, were you a part of both panels or just one, one of the panels? Just one panel. One of the panel discussions. Were there any areas of interesting, significant, or fruitful disagreement? Well, I think the most um, potentially explosive uh, point of disagreement uh, was over the more traditionally reformed view of the church, which, say, John Piper would represent, uh, and the emerging reformed people like Mark Driscoll. And some of those issues were not really explored in the conference, although they were out in the open. And in Piper and Driscoll, I think you have to rather different uh, mindsets. I think in John Piper, uh, you have somebody who's, whose preoccupations are almost totally biblical slash theological. And in Mark Driscoll's, you have somebody whose, whose mental life is made up almost entirely uh, of, uh, of sort of postmodern happenings but who uh, is, is finding his way out of that and into Reformed theology. Whereas Piper, by his own admission, has not 
found his way from Reformed theology into too many connections into culture. So the, does John Piper need to read your four books? I believe he has read them, uh, but I don't think his preoccupations have quite caught up with what he's read. <laughs> so just for our listeners, remind, remind them what your project is that you've undertaken in these four volumes together. No Place for Truth, God in the Wasteland, Losing Our Virtue, and now this final one, Above All Earthly Powers. Yes. This was a project that was really <clears throat> handed to me uh, because I was given uh, a wonderfully generous grant by the Pew Foundation to explore the question as to why theology is disappearing and uh, specifically in its evangelical form. And I took that... Uh, did, you, did you agree with that as a thesis? I did agree with it. Uh, but I was looking uh, not so much at the doing of, of conservative and, and evangelical scholarly theology, which actually has been flowering. Uh, there have been more sort of conservative uh, systematic theologies written in the last two or three decades than I think there had Previous been. Previous century. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that has been flowering. But my question was... Uh, what has happened to, to theology in the life of the church? And so that was the project I undertook. And so I, I began with what might be uh, looked at as a sort of um, a cultural prolegomena, a sort of uh, a primer on, on the interface between culture and Christianity. And that was the book that I was asked to do for the purposes of the grant. But once I'd started on this project, I began to see that I could really follow through a fairly traditional theological sequence. So uh, the next one I did was to try to well, think... The next one? The next book. The first one? The first book was No Place for Truth, which was the sort of cultural primer um, on the interface between Christianity and, and modernity. The second book was um, God in the Wasteland, which was trying to think about the way in which our experience of the modern world affects how we think about God and specifically uh, how we lose transcendence and relocate everything into imminence, which means everything into the self. So that led naturally to a third book, which was Losing Our Virtue, uh, which was looking at what happens to us as we try to understand ourselves within a therapeutic culture in which recovery takes a place of regeneration. And then the final book was uh, a book on the person of Christ confronting the meaninglessness and emptiness of a postmodern world uh, with the person work of Christ. Why not keep going in the heads of theology? Why stop with Christ? Because you get doctrine of the church, doctrine of God, doctrine of man and sin, doctrine of person work of Christ. Why not head on into doctrine of the spirit, the Christian life, the church? You point there in your last chapter yes. in Above All Earthly Powers. Well, it was my plan to do the doctrine of the church. Um, but I find that I'm uh, running out of energy mm. for this project. Mm. And I well, think, you've been doing it for, what, 13 years? Yes, I think yeah. I've said enough. And I think people, if they're interested, can probably infer enough. Now, I am doing a final volume, which I'm currently working on, and which has a working title of The Courage to be Protestant. And it has... Sort of a play on Tillich's The Courage to Be? Yes. <laughs> and it has a subtitle, Truth I Lovers, like Truth Lovers, Marketers, and Emergence in a Postmodern World. Wow. Okay. There's so much we can talk about. That. David, there you go hitting on marketing again. Yes. I mean, what's wrong with marketing concerns being considered as part of how Christians can spread the faith or, or, or pastors should grow church? Well, we need to uh, think about what we mean by marketing. Uh, I do not mean uh, 
uh, simply advertising when a church meets. Carl Henry's earliest books were on advertising the church, church public, successful church publicity. Yes. I think that may be the title of his first book. Yes. No, I'm not talking about advertising. Uh, I'm talking <coughs> about uh, adapting uh, the gospel and the Christian message uh, to fit generational niches and to fit generational habits. Uh, that is what Willow Creek uh, inaugurated. Uh, the church, the evangelical church, has become Willow creek eyes significantly Willow creek eyes It is true that the emergence are, as so often happens in our world, um, a reaction to that in large measure, but not a total reaction. Uh, uh, some of those uh, marketing habits have continued. It's just that instead of marketing to the boomers, which is what Willow Creek got stuck on, mm -hmm. uh, Gen Xs are the target niche and the target generation for the emergent crowd. So there is a point of connection, but the emergent crowd are also reacting against the emptiness and, and the shallowness and the triviality of much of what has resulted uh, from the marketing of the gospel. So there is both continuity and discontinuity. Now, to get back more specifically to Above All Earthly Powers, how is this a book on Jesus Christ? And I've read the book as a whole, I think fairly carefully, and read parts of it several times. How is it a book about Jesus Christ? Well, the argument um, that I make, which is uh, a biblical argument, uh, is that the language we have, uh, for example, in the Gospel of John, uh, and indeed through the Pauline epistles, uh, is the language of the coming supernatural age to come, which has come, and it has come specifically in the person of Christ. Uh, you get the vertical, the spatial images, especially in the Gospel of John, that he who was above came below. He who was in glory became enfleshed. But it is in Paul 2, obviously Philippians chapter 2, he who shared all of the glory and all of the attributes of God, uh, stripped these aside, did not clutch onto his divine prerogatives, and was incarnate. Uh, so there you get the same kind of thought um, that uh, Christ, though he was rich for year, our sakes, became poor, and so on. Um, so that's what I'm looking at, the inauguration of the age to come, which the New Testament uh, explores in a number of ways. But I do uh, try to make the argument that um, one of the chief texts, this is not uh, an argument original to me, uh, one of the chief Old Testament texts, which is cited 21 times, in the New Testament is Psalm 110, verse 1, um, uh, in which speaks uh, of the elevation of Christ as he waits until all of his enemies should be made his footstool. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, the image uh, of a conquering king who, who shows his conquest and at the same time humiliates the foe that's being conquered by putting his foot on that foe's head or neck. And this, of course, is what has happened in the cross uh, when the powers of darkness were embarrassed, as Paul tells us in Colossians, and more than that, when the back of evil was broken. Uh, this is our gospel message to our own broken world. Okay, I hear that as a very faithful sort of storytelling of the gospel through the New Testament. How is that related to your book? Because the book tells that story. Uh, and you particularly look at the way our world today makes it hard for us to hear that story or to understand that story, or it makes it hard for that story to seem credible or to make sense to us. Uh, it is, in some ways, it, it, it is harder. Uh, one of the things that I point out um, in the book uh, is um, the, the um, extraordinary set of changes that have been brought about in our culture uh, by two, two, from two different angles. On the one hand, you have 
uh, following 1965, the change of the Immigration Act, uh, you have this uh, uh, impact uh, on our culture of immigrants. Uh, now the recipe... People from Zambia. Uh, yeah, there are some. Uh, but now the recipe has been changed. You know, in, in the 19th century, most of the immigrants, the great majority, were European. Uh, the great majority today are not European. They are Asian, South American, and Middle Eastern. And these immigrants have brought into the country uh, different worldviews. The ancient religions from Asia, uh, as well as non-European Protestantism and, for that matter, Catholicism, yeah. um, a, as well as Islam from, from uh, the Middle East. So that's one of the great changes. The other great change that, that I think is extraordinary uh, is that uh, in the last decade or two, uh, our, our cultural mood has shifted from being that where the secular humanists look like they're about to dominate everything to now, secular humanism is contained in a few cultural pockets, as in academia, uh, the leading newspapers, Hollywood. Uh, you have these pockets of secular humanism. But the great majority of Americans are not there. 78% that say that they are spiritual. Now, 30 years ago, uh, that was not the case at all. So we have become a spiritual nation, predominantly spiritual. That's how people think of themselves. Mm -hmm. And we've become very, very aware of all of the religions. So this puts the Christian message about Christ and his work in a very, very different context. The context more like the New Testament. Much closer to the New Testament. So, so when you say doing theology in light of internal and external concerns, you're, you're meaning some of this. You're meaning the internal concerns are what you did in the person of Christ. Yes. The external concerns are what you're trying to supply with this book. Exactly. Can you just tease that out a little bit more for us about how we should, as Christians, particularly, and a lot of people listening to this will be preachers, how we, when we look at the text, should think about theology, its internal concerns and external concerns? Well, I don't think that we can uh, forge that kind of uh, connection without doing hard work on both ends. Uh, We've obviously got to do hard work on the text, the text of Scripture, but we've got to do hard work on our culture too. And, and I find that... So you appreciated Mark Driscoll's presentation or his influence on John Piper at the conference, for example. I appreciated Mark Driscoll raising the question. Right. Uh, but I think all of us have to work much harder at finding an answer to it. We need to understand... Harder than you have in these books? Yeah, I think so. We need to understand uh, that, that what is in collision today is not simply competing messages. Now, that's what we like to think in the churches, that everybody's hearing different messages, uh, messages about products, messages about lifestyles. Yeah. That is true, but it is not simply that. What is in competition today is different worldviews. Uh, in which people conceive of themselves mm -hmm. and understand reality and frame reality in entirely different and mutually exclusive ways. That is what we in the church do not understand clearly. Yeah, I think that's a little bit what in my preaching I try to get at when I will often address the non-Christian directly. And I'll say, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I wonder how this sounds to you. Do these virtues even sound like virtues to you? Or on Sunday when I was preaching from Second Peter 1, and it talks about escaping from the corruption of this present world and it, uh, caused by e our evil desires. You know, I, I raise the question, do you want to, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, do you see how your lusts or your desires affect you? Do you ever find those effects unpleasant? Do you ever want to escape those desires? Do you feel ever trapped by them? Or do you accept, as so many people say today, that we are defined by our immediate desires? That's who we are. Do you mean that kind of thing? I that would be just the little baby steps. I think that's the front door through which you go. Because yeah. uh, in asking those questions, you're asking that listener uh, in your church uh, to think 
about their own internal life. And I'm also helping the Christians to do it because they're hearing me do that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. However, yeah. Uh, the next step, were you to sit down and talk with this person, right. uh, the next step would be to try to help them to understand how in their own minds they have framed those desires and feelings. So, so you're saying it's important to think about this because we, you're not quite going as far as to say we effectively can't do evangelism without doing this. You're not quite going that far. No. Um, uh, the, the, the point that we always need to understand uh, is that the people are illogical, irrational, inconsistent. So they're a lot like you and me. Uh, yes, uh, probably they are. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, um, you know, they will think things for which they have no adequate reason. They will make connections when the connections aren't there. And sometimes, for all of those reasons, the simplest gospel presentation cuts right through to the very quick of their lives. Mm. Yeah, I've seen that happen. I have too. Yeah. So I'm not discounting just very simple gospel sharing. But at the same time, uh, that isn't true of everyone. Mm -hmm. And if we're really going to help people, uh, we, we, we need to, to, to get down to the sort of uh, inner layers of that onion uh, within themselves. One of the things that you say in Above All Earthly Powers is that the Word of God needs to be more present in our services. Uh, I don't know if you remember where you wrote about that, but you said that um, the lack of that is, you, you use some phrase like you, you leave the service open to, being, to following another, another script. Do you remember the passage I'm talking about? Or how practically would you say that uh, the word is absent? How do you perceive its absence in many evangelical services today? Let me just back off just for, 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 for a second. Yeah and uh, say that uh, one of the great and bad things that has happened to us, and I tried to write about this a little bit in uh, Losing Our Virtue, is that most people today inhabit a therapeutic world. Uh, it's one where the self, our understanding of the self, has replaced our understanding of human nature. Uh, it's a world which is not morally framed, when you believe in human nature made in the image of God, you will put that understanding within a moral framework. And it is a framework, at least for Christians, um, that um, uh, arises from our understanding of God as holy. When you inhabit a therapeutic world, that is not so. Now, just at that point, already you have two very competing and different ways of understanding conflicts or desires, troublesome desires that a person might identify within themselves. You've been preaching a sermon and you say to that person, do you, do you identify with what Paul says here about these unruly desires? And the person in the pew says to him or herself, yes, I do. But then the quest, next question is, well, what does this mean? Now, if you live in a therapeutic world, your assumption is everybody uh, is an emotional wreck that is about to happen. That what is going to save that is if you get those feelings out on the table. That being emotionally naked is itself a saving thing. And therefore, you've got to express your feelings, including these unruly desires that the preacher has just identified. Mm. So, now, on the other hand, if you are a Christian, you will handle that very differently because you will make a moral judgment and you'll be trying to decide whether those unruly desires... So you'll make a moral judgment even about your own emotions. Exactly. Exactly. So, depending on whether you, in your mind, are inhabiting a moral world or not will depend how you handle those feelings. Okay, so back to the modern evangelical service in which you say the word is absent. What do you mean by that? Um, <coughs> we should, in, in our worship services, 
uh, sees every opportunity uh, to invite people into the world of God's truth. And uh, there are many different ways of doing it, uh, from our hymns which do it, uh, the, the uh, uh, invocation that starts the service, uh, to, at its heart, uh, the preaching of the Word of God, uh, and even the benediction at the end. Mm. Uh, everything needs to be woven together uh, to bring through the word of God, which is his truth, uh, to bring that person into the presence of God. It seems to me one question that we're left with in all of this, and maybe it was a, a nettle that wasn't grasped at the Piper Conference, was the, is the question of contextualization. Because on the one hand, you seem to be all about contextualization, on the other hand, you're very clear that the Word of God must be dominantly present. It must be central. So, I mean, you, you know today among young church planters, uh, everything from Christ's incarnation itself to Paul's ministry is pointed at as an example of contextualization. People are forever quoting 1 Corinthians 9.22, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. It's a very popular verse today. How, how should we understand Paul's example here? So I've become all things to all people. I've become chic to the chic. I've become a groupthink person that, to a groupthink Yeah, that's what you're person. saying no. No, that's, Of course you're saying no. Not. Well, so what do you... So that, is, that is the absurdity of the way in which that verse is being read. No. Um, what we're losing today uh, are the elements of Christ against culture. What we are accenting are the elements of Christ in continuity with culture. And maybe Christ transforming culture? Um, the Christ transforming culture is there, but what I hear uh, in continuity. Is, is continuity. And let us remember, this is the old liberal Protestantism. That's why I love these spatial images that I've tried to write about uh, in my book, uh, even in the title, Above All Earthly Powers, because this is reminding us uh, that Christ and the world are two different things, uh, even in the title, Above All Earthly Powers, because this is reminding us uh, that Christ and the world are two different things. See, you're really an architect, aren't you? I mean, all these little details that most of us don't even notice, you see this great significance in. So even that special image in the first word of your title, you invest. You're aware most people will never pick that up. They probably won't, but... Oh, David, they probably won't. They, they probably won't, but, <laughs> but at least... Uh, at least have the satisfaction I think, of knowing. I, I thought when I picked that title that at least they would know that I'd borrowed words from well, Martin sure. Luther's yeah, yeah. hymn but when I said to somebody who asked me what the title of the book was, and I told this person what it was, uh, she actually looked blank. She had never heard of Martin Luther's great mm. hymn. Wow. But then back to the question positively, you said negatively how we shouldn't understand Paul's example. How positively should we understand that example of contextualization? What, what should we be led to do by this? Well, contextualization simply means uh, understanding your world. Now, why would we want to understand it? The answer is because we want to understand... You said we have to in order to preach the gospel. We, we want to understand how people are thinking, how they're processing the gospel. I, if we don't do that, what's going to happen is that Christianity becomes a veneer, which is sort of slapped on them, but as it were, the deep structures are, challenged. are never challenged. And therefore they can never be shaped by, informed by. Exactly. So today in America you have 45% who claim to be born again, only 9% or even less, maybe even 7%, have any clue what it means to be uh, a biblical disciple. Now, whatever's happened, whatever the explanation is, they have an example of, of apparently the gospel, Christian faith, not really taking root in people's lives. So contextualization to me means understanding where 
how people think and why they think so that we can bring to bear the gospel on them more effectively. In our generation, uh, there is no greater word than we can give than the word of truth because this is a generation that's given up on the language of truth and on the idea of truth and they're paying the consequences for it. So we can joyfully proclaim uh, to this um, confused and um, uh, generation that's, that's meaningless and, and rootless, uh, we have a word of truth. So positively trying to think for the pastor, when, when he is trying to prepare a sermon, at that point, you, you, if you were more like me, you would want to interrupt you and go, Mark, no, if, it's, if, he's try, if he's trying to do this when he's preparing the sermon, he's waited too late. Uh, David, you're talking about a discipline of reading, engagement, reflection on how you do normally engage with the culture anyway, which is like a sort of an extra loop where you need to not only have done that thing, but you need to take time to reflect on that thing and see what is implicit in it or what was meant by that news story or what was the message of that Robin Williams film or and then think further about when you speak plan to speak these biblical words in your sermon, I guess just press, it's sort of like the application question, I guess. Just press yourself to think, how will these kinds of hearers understand this? And then how do I interact with that? I, I certainly think it's fine occasionally uh, uh, to make reference to some cultural event, maybe a movie, if, if everybody, if you think enough people have seen it or perhaps a passing reference to a TV show, if, that's, if there's a point that can be made. But what I have in mind, actually, is something that's deeper than those things. Movies and TV shows come and go, and we forget them pretty quickly. Uh, what stays, what lingers, indeed, even in our souls, is, is the impress of living in a modernized world. You, you know it the moment you move outside the West, and I go to Africa every summer and you're going to be coming with me next summer, mm. you enter a different world when you go there. So what is it that makes it different? Why is it that they, they assume many things that we can't assume here in the West? Why is it that they've been so strong on some moral issues and weaker on others in comparison to us here in the West. What is it about our culture here in America that sort of talks us around? Now, that's the sort of thing that I think we need to be working on, reflecting on, and trying to understand. Now, I don't think you, you have to bring this into every single sermon, and sometimes you can bring it in without people even knowing that you have done it. But you are saying as a preacher, you need to have a very self-conscious pursuit of understanding your context. I think you do. I think you do. And, you know, we here in the West and in America in particular uh, carry within us all kinds of deficits that we've never probably put our fingers on simply because we come out of whatever, divorced homes, we, we're rootless, we shift around, we don't make connections with other people very easily, uh, ideas change so rapidly, morals change so rapidly, um, that we, we, we come into life with deficits. And, and Christian faith is, is really uh, the great remedy of those deficits. And it is, it's the preacher that has got to make that kind of connection for people. And I, I'm going to preach uh, a sermon uh, in a week or two, uh, which will actually be very consciously aimed at what I know is a deficit in people, uh, that Christian people really know that God loves them. If you ask them that, they'll tell you that that's what they believe. But on the day-to-day -day hall, in the midst of the ambiguities of life and the conflicts and the pains and, and the things that go unresolved in their lives, uh, 
and things to which they have no answers, they really do wonder about it. And even if they don't consciously wonder about mm -hmm. it, they're not conscious of the fact uh, of God's goodness to them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this without ever actually speaking specifically of that deficit. But I know that it's going to be there in my listeners. And with no immodesty, you're saying this is what we should do to contextualize. This is what contextualizes it really is. What do we want to avoid? I think what we want to avoid is compromise. Uh, and this is always a danger. Uh, when, when, when you're trying to engage your culture and engage the way people think, yeah. you really feel the pressure to be liked. And, and you feel... Thus, maybe the popularity of comedy in services today because you get an immediate positive response? Exactly. P uh, plus the fact that th this, is, uh, this is an entertainment age. Oh. Uh, we are used to being entertained. And maybe, maybe because life is so stressful that we, we seek it. So are these the kind of reasons why a minister should read Above All Earthly Powers? They'll help him to think about this kind of stuff? You don't even have to answer that. I think the answer to that is yes. Um, well, I, I, I tried to do it. Yeah. Um, obviously, I haven't uh, explored all of the interfaces between person, work of Christ, and our contemporary culture because that would require several volumes. But I, I did try to work on some of the more important ones. So you intend this book to help us avoid some of the more dangerous aspects of our context, modernity, post-modernity? I haven't set it up quite like that, right. but that obviously uh, is the case because it's clear uh, from this book that I think uh, that Christianity is about truth and the gospel is the truth that we declare. I mean, oh. Paul describes the gospel as believing the truth and embracing the truth. And you can't embrace something which is true and at the same time an amalgam with culture because then that is no longer truth in Paul's sense. Yeah. We're getting near the end. We have, we have maybe about 10 minutes left. I, I want to just think maybe about some other resources that would help people on this topic. Um, is it still useful for people to read Niebuhr's Christ and Culture, H. Richard Niebuhr, Christ and Culture? Niebuhr did, is, is it worthwhile for a Bible-believing pastor to read today? Yeah, Niebuhr did the great service of giving us language, <laughs> yeah. and he gave us some models to think in. And I find that helpful, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, where Niebuhr is not helpful, in my judgment, uh, is that he was thinking of America in the 1950s. And it was a far less complex, and I dare say culturally, a more innocent country then than it is today. So I don't think Niebuhr sees the dangers in culture that we know today mm -hmm. are there. I would just add one final point on Niebuhr. Uh, after he'd written uh, that particular book, he did go on to say that people misused his book and people thought that they had to choose one or other of the positions that he outlines in the book, Christ against culture or Christ con transforming culture or the Christ of culture and so on, five of them. What he actually uh, believes uh, is that most of the time there are multiple models of Christ and culture in play. And at different periods in the church's life, different models have to be emphasized. I'm inclined to think personally uh, that we need to recover more of the Christ against culture for our time. Not exclusively, not to become monastic communities mm -hmm. and Amish, but more of that mm -hmm. over-againstness. Yeah. You know, it's, it's Tim, Tim Keller and I have talked recently at some length about kind of about that and when we got down to it, I'm not sure we had many differences in the way we were looking at the church's responsibility for the culture at large. He was more um, careful than I had thought he was from just listening to some of his things. 
And I, I hope he was pleasantly surprised at some of the things that we are engaged in, we do encourage in our congregation. A lot of what it got down to was he was more optimistic about the culture's reception by and large around, and I was more pessimistic. And uh, I wonder if you're sounding a little more pessimistic. Well, I, I think... We could gussy it up and call it Augustinian. You're sounding more Augustinian. Well, I, of course, I am Augustinian. <laughs> and um, so is Tim. Yes. It's, um, I have uh, subdued expectations uh, of how far this culture uh, can be changed or any society. Uh, I'm inclined to think that the illustrations that we often look to, yeah. namely John Wesley or the Wesleys and uh, Shaftesbury and yeah. uh, that period in Britain, I think we overlook the fact uh, that those great social transformations happened uh, immediately following this great uh, revival and awakening. And I'm inclined to think that actually the great motivator of those changes was, was a different perception about human, human value mm. uh, that, that came out of a Christian understanding. It was a recovered Christian understanding from the revival. That then led to the social transformation. So, uh, without which is not a subtle way of speaking against working for directly, working directly for the social transformation. No, I, I do believe um, that there is a place for that. We are to love our neighbour, and we are to be truth and light, and we are to be preservatives. Uh, so those things are all appropriate, and they should um, sometimes precede, sometimes accompany, sometimes follow the actual preaching of the gospel. The gospel is primary. It is our primary responsibility to the world, uh, not social renovation. Uh, I, I think uh, the pessimistic, optimistic um, thing, I think, is perhaps located at different places now. Uh, I am much more optimistic uh, about getting a hearing for the gospel in this postmodern context mm -hmm. uh, than was true in a more modernized context. Mm. I am more pessimistic that people will understand uh, uh, the extent of the Christian message yeah. uh, than was the case before. Mm. So as someone who gets around a bit, how do you think preachers are doing on communicating a way to understand the world? You say that we need to put, to put together a whole way to understand things. How are preachers doing at that? Well, I, I'm not really in a position to judge that because I, I don't listen to too many preachers on Sunday morning beside my own or my own voice. Um, but I think as a generalization, I would say that on the one side, uh, one of the great things that has happened has been the recovery, uh, I think perhaps among younger preachers of expository preaching. And I greatly... Uh, applaud that. On the other hand, there has been a renewal of interest in understanding the culture. Now, these two parties... You want them to get together? I want them to get together. Oh. I wish they would talk to each other. Uh, now, if I have to choose which I want, mm -hmm. which I want to live with, and what I want to hear, yeah. it will be a pure exposition, because at least I can take something from that. Exactly. Yeah. Rather than just a clever, yeah. uh, a clever little um, uh, essay on cultural happenings, mm -hmm. uh, which is valueless, meaningless to my own spiritual life, without the former. But what I would like is for us to put our heads together. And I wish we could learn. And I wish those who were so au courant, so current with culture, and who wanted to be so chic, uh, would learn that, that all of that chicness is worthless without the Word of God. And I wish those who loved the Word of God could just fill out that love and the love that they have for people by understanding that their work as a pastor is to take that word of God 
and just take it one step further and make those connections for people. Uh, just to ask a horrible question at this point, but why doesn't that happen? Because wouldn't that work if it did happen? I mean, that's the ultimate pragmatic question. Would, or is consumerism, that's typical in our culture, does consumerism work against pastors doing exactly what you're saying we should do? It probably does work against it because... It's not very efficient? Because as much as pastors and members of the church would deny it, I, I think we are all very conscious of how many people are in church right. and whether we're being successful or not. And the measure of those things is numerical, it's visible. What you were talking about uh, is actually very hard to judge um, how far and how deeply, uh, with what effects, uh, the gospel truth, the Christian message, the expository message has, uh, has uh, taken root. So if a young pastor is listening to this, because you're particularly chic, David, among the younger crowd, if a young pastor is listening to this, or pastor in training, let's say at a seminarian, would you incur him, encourage him to prefer working in an urban church over taking a, a church in a small town or a rural area? Oh, I, I don't think we should ever make that kind of uh, choice. All right, let's for, take it out of the individual realm. Tim no. Keller talks about the significance of, of churches. Jacques Ellul, ta- uh, cities. Jacques Ellul talked about you know, the significance of that. It is a population fact that our world is urbanizing. Do, do you see the, these very cultural forces that typify the day we live in magnified in the city, and therefore, do you particularly desire evangelical ministers to step up to that challenge? Um, we have found, we evangelicals, I think, have found cities in America inhospitable. And if you look at an election map of the last presidential election, you'll probably understand why. Uh, it's the oh, rural you're areas. Not, you're not assuming evangelicals are Republicans. No, I wouldn't make such an assumption. Uh, but uh, the, the rural... Are, are you an American? I am an American. I'm an African American. Okay, just uh, checking. The rural parts of America... And I meant Zimbabwe earlier. I'm sorry, I said yes. Zambia. The rural parts of America tend to be more traditional in their ways of thinking and values. The, the cities are, are places where all kinds of viewpoints, worldviews, religions meet they become uh, melting pots in the sense that you have the sort of cauldron of competing views and so forth. And uh, this, is, this is a less hospitable place for people who believe in absolute truth. But this is where our population is concentrated. Uh, and indeed, in 1999, the entire world became more urbanized than rural. So strategically, we need to think in terms of cities, but that doesn't mean to say we should turn our back on the rural parts at all. Well, in your book, you talk about one of the things that happens in cities is functions replace family. Yes. Do you remember that? I mean, it's, why is that significant? It, sort of a depersonalizing of our experience of life? Uh, well, well, families... Um, families and cities um, are under enormous strain mm. um, because you don't you don't have your own territory and uh, you have multiple relationships that you have to maintain and so many of them are commercial and superficial. Uh, so it's this is just a much uh, tougher thing to plow. Okay, we've just got a couple of minutes left. A couple of, of quick ones. What does the gospel have to do with success? Uh, I don't know what the connection is. Uh, the success that we look for um, is uh, visible and numerical and uh, budgets. Uh, I don't think uh, that necessarily correlates with our faithfulness to the gospel. Uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. What does the gospel have to do with therapy? Very little. Uh, the gospel comes out of a moral world. It's dealing with uh, sin. So when you say therapy, you mean there is no culpability. Nobody's guilty for anything in the world of therapy. One's passive. One is a victim. One has been acted upon. One is not an actor who is held accountable. That's what you, you have all that freight in the word therapy. That's exactly right. Uh, therapism, um, as uh, One Nation Under God describes it. Right. Christina Hoff Sommer's book. Okay. And uh, do you think, then, that the privatization that you talk of in this book, 
makes it more difficult for us to be critical of our own desires? I think it does um, uh, because our desires uh, tend to become sovereign uh, because uh, there is nothing, there's very little outside of us that in, really engages us. We're not embedded, many of us, in families, certainly not in extended families. We're not rooted in a place. We don't have a history uh, that has parts to it. We're free-floating individuals. Therefore, all of reality tends to contract into the self. Uh, and that makes Christian faith very difficult because the self and its own sovereignty get tangled up with God. David, there is so much more I want us to talk about, but we have exhausted the time we have. Thank you for giving us this time, and uh, I pray the Lord continue to bless you in your work. Thank you. It's just been my pleasure and delight. To learn more about Nine Marks, visit our website, www.ninemarks.org. There you'll find articles, book reviews, tutorials, audio resources, and information about upcoming Nine Marks events. When you visit ninemarks.org, be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-newsletter, Nine News. Again, the web address is www.the number9marks.org.